Everybody doing okay? Somebody is okay. Uh, my, my name is Cody Sykes. I'm the, uh, the campus pastor here and just, um, just excited to be here. Uh, I unfortunately had to miss some time because of that old COVID bug. Um, tried to come and get on me and we got it whooped, thank God. So, yeah. It was touch and go for a little bit, I'm gonna be honest. It was like, this is, this is, not, this is not good. And then uh, thankfully, uh, I met a doctor who is one of those kinds of people that it's like, the Lord has given me an assignment and it is to prescribe the very best that I know to prescribe and watch it work. And she's like, regardless of uh, what is said about what I'm prescribing you or regardless of what people think about what I'm prescribing you, I know that it works and far be it for me to not actually treat COVID if I can treat COVID. And so she prescribed me some things that uh, within six hours of taking the first round, um, I had no more symptoms. So, um, yeah, I'm super, um, super, super thankful for, for professionals that also have a high call to God and they respond to that. So um, bless her, she's, she's, she's a miracle worker, super cool. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you after. <laughs> um, no, I'm excited about being here. I, I wanted to share something really briefly just before we get into the message. This is not, not what I'm gonna preach. Uh, I just felt like I needed to give this to you as just an encouragement. Uh, anybody like to be encouraged? Yes. Good. Uh, I was praying this morning in my office and, and just kind of getting ready for, for today, and, and I, I saw this picture. Uh, sometimes the Lord speaks to me in pictures. Uh, don't, don't disregard pictures if you get pictures, if they're abstract and random. I believe God always wants to speak, and God is always speaking, and so even if you're like, I don't know what this picture means, write it down, write the description, the, the description down, and the Lord might reveal to you what it is later, but I do believe God is speaking. But I saw this sunrise, and it was like the sun was rising over us. And uh, I, I was thinking, okay, sunrise, like new beginnings. There's, there's, a, there's a newness to the sunrise. There's a new day dawning. There's different things happening. And I went to uh, Isaiah chapter 60, and I just wanted to kind of read this over you. I just believe that this should be encouragement to you. But it says this, arise and shine. Like when you wake up in the morning, your, your thoughts should be, I'm rising and therefore I'm going to shine. In other words, the thing that's on the inside of me, it's fixing to get released because there is no other option. So he says, arise and shine for your light has come. And Jesus called himself the light. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness will cover people. But the Lord will rise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. I just want you to understand that because of who you are in the kingdom of God and because you're a born again believer of God, you're a son or a daughter of the highest king, that when you wake up in the morning, you ought to know that there's something inside of you that's waiting to be released. The moment that you just decide to be who you are in Christ is the moment that that light that's on the inside of you is released and people are actually drawn to Jesus that's on the inside of you. So you need to start confessing, I am the head and I'm not the tail. I'm above and I'm not beneath. I am, I am blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. Start shifting your thoughts and shifting your mind to produce this thing and make it a reality in your life, amen? If you don't believe the words that are in the scripture, they mean nothing. They're, they're weak and they're, they're powerless. But the moment that your faith is attached to anything that the word says about you is the moment that it's activated in your life and it becomes powerful, amen? Amen, so I just wanted to bless you with that. Arise and shine, your light has come. Amen? amen. Cool. Y'all all right? All right, just making sure, just making sure. Uh, I'm excited about, about preaching the message that I'm gonna preach today, the message title, if you're taking notes, if you're a note taker and you need a title, it is, if Jesus had a church today. If Jesus had a church today. I like this title. My daughter, she's sitting on the front row, she's 12, she asked me last night, Dad, what are you preaching tomorrow? And 
I said, well, the title of the message is if Jesus had a church today. And she goes, oof. If he had a church, I would leave our church and go to his church. Oh. I'm not even mad about that at all. Like, how could you be mad about your kid wanting to leave your church and go to Jesus' church? And I was talking to her about, well, actually, the intention and the heart's desire is that if Jesus had a church today, ours should actually look like the one that he would build. And so she agreed, and so that's what we're going to talk about today, if Jesus had a church today. So you can go with me to John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. This is a very famous set of scriptures in, in the Gospels. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a really great exchange. And so it says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that, that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. <clears throat> when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked, and he, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and this well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from, it from, drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? This woman was a little bit feisty. Yeah. Like Jesus just asked for a drink and she's just spitting accusations. <laughs> Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Then the woman, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I, may, that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw this water. And he told her, Go and call your husband and come back. She said, I have, no repos no, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. I wonder how she saw that. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. What an incredible moment. I was reading that yesterday, and I just got overwhelmed with, with just, I just got overwhelmed and just began to almost weep. Like, this woman had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And I want to dive into what, it, what, it, what all of this actually even looked like to her. And I want to be honest about today's message, like, this message is, is near and dear to my heart because as a pastor, my desire for you, no other desire is deeper than to know that you fall in love with Jesus. Like, I honestly have, I could care less if you fall in love with our church because of our worship or if you fall in love with our church because of the things that we do that are quote unquote different than other churches. If you don't fall in love with Jesus, we've done nothing. That's just the way that I feel. That's what I was given when this whole journey for me started. I was given Jesus. 
I was giving Jesus in such a way that I couldn't refuse what he had done in my life. And so because I freely received all that Jesus did for me, my whole intention as a pastor is to have you fall in love with Jesus. Not just as savior, not just as friend, but as provider, as healer, as prince of peace, as your God of hope. Like I truly desire that you have an encounter with Jesus every single time that you come because it's the only hope. And so that's why this message has such a deep place in my heart. You ever found yourself in a position where um, you feel like you didn't fit in? Or you feel like you just didn't belong in a situation? Anybody ever been there? Um, Maybe it was a setting, maybe it was like an environment, or maybe it was the people, or maybe it was the activity. And maybe for you it was like um, when when you went to prom, and then you were expected to dance, but the only moves that you knew were this? Yeah. Anybody ever been there? Like, it was an awkward moment for me, too. I'll just... But we, we find ourselves in these moments often, and I was thinking about a moment, and the, and, and, and the moment that I was thinking of is when we had our first kid. Well, when Stacy had our first kid and I was just in the room. Like, it was a moment that I felt like I truly don't belong here. Like, actually, Lord, I think you made a mistake. Like, what is a guy supposed to do? I've never been in this position before. I'm like, do I stay up here? Do I go down there? My wife's like, you better not go down there. Like, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to do with your hands. You don't know what to do with your words. Everything that you say might get your head bit off because your wife's in pain. Like, it's a moment where you're like, I don't belong in this moment. How did I get here? If you've never been in this moment, just wait. You'll join a brotherhood of men that just weren't sure what was going on. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, well, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to either stand against this wall over here, and I'm going to slide down the wall and pass out, or I'm just going to leave. Like, I don't know what to do. It's like in those moments where you're, awkward, where you're awkwardly uncertain, and you're so full of anxiety, and you don't know what to do, it's like you can't, you can't escape fast enough. And I think that we find this woman in this situation. Like a situation where she's like, I don't know if I belong in this conversation with this man who just told me that he would give me water that would make me never be thirsty again. Whoever that is, that's weird. And now he's telling me that he's Jesus. And I kind of got a big sin in my life. Like she's in a, she's in a pretty interesting spot. And I, I think Jesus did it to her on purpose because he has a sense of humor. Uh, but I want to draw just a couple of things out of the scripture to our attention. So we see Jesus comes in this town. It says that he's literally like hungry, thirsty. He's tired from this journey that he's been on. Walks up to this Samaritan woman who see, he sees her filling her jug and is like, hey, he initiates this conversation with this woman and he asks for a drink. John chapter four and verse nine, it says this. The Samaritan woman said to him, this was her response, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews and Samaritans, they don't associate. In other words, why are you talking to me? That's basically her answer to Jesus. Why are you talking to me? Now to understand the significance of what she's saying, we've gotta know a couple things. We have to understand this. There's great tension at this time between Jews and Samaritans. There was political tension, there, were, there was religious tension, there was racial tension, but the tension could be summed up like this. There was tension because there were differences. And oftentimes I think that we fall into tension because of differences. That's slightly different political views, slightly different religious views, slightly different views on marriage. There's all these different things that created tension. And because of these reasons, they hated each other. So much so that this woman is literally like, why are you talking to me? Move along, little guy. They had nothing to do with each other. Now the sad thing that could be said is if you didn't hear the first part and know that I was talking about Jews and Samaritans, you would think that I was actually talking about churches in the United States and their differences. Or even taking a step further, you could think that I was talking about churches in Midland, Texas, who have so many differences that they actually don't associate. We, we see differences in a lot of different ways, but we see differences as because there's a difference, we're unequal. 
or because there's a difference, they're unwelcomed. Or because there's a difference, uh, it, that church is unrelatable to me. Or those people are unrelatable to me. I wanna say this really quick, side note. Be very careful if out of your mouth you say things like those people. Be careful about those people type of comments. Because what, what those people type of comments are insinuating is that you are above a certain kind of people. And the Lord is the giver of grace to those who are humble and he rejects the proud. So be careful about those people type of comments. Um, just side note, that was a freebie. But oftentimes even, even different means that that is an easier target for jokes. And the biggest one is different, and a lot of times it equates to them just being flat out wrong. And so I want to ask just a couple of difficult questions to you. The question that I would ask you first is, how do you treat people that are different than you? Like true, truly different than you. Do you avoid them? Do you hide from them? If, 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 if any of these answers within yourself is yes, just keep looking forward and no one will know that, that this is talking to you. It'll be, it'll be totally fine. What are some of the thoughts that you think about people that are different than you? This is inward stuff. Like if you can't be honest with you, who are you being honest with? So I'm just asking you these questions, just internalize them. How many friends do you have that don't look anything like you do? Do you only associate with a certain type? Now I'm not talking about being unequally yoked with an unbeliever, like you could take this into a ditch. I'm saying, do you celebrate different? Or are you stuck in, if it doesn't look like, think like, or act like me, I push it away. We, we might be thinking like, well, okay, what, what difference is, what, what, what exactly do you mean by different? There's so many different categories of, of difference. Some of the, like the cliche that shouldn't even be an argument anymore. Like white or black, shouldn't even be an argument. Like just love people. Rich or poor, shouldn't be an argument. Love people. Conservative or liberal, shouldn't be an argument anymore. We ought to just be able to love people. Then they get more specific. You got like, well, I don't hang out with country folk because I'm a country. And I only hang out with city people because I don't understand the country people. No, I'm blue collar, and so I hang out with them because they understand me and I don't associate with the other side. Or I don't wear skinny jeans, I wear Wranglers, and so I don't mess with either one of those either. It's like, we have all these different, I eat meat, they don't eat meat. That could be a, another debate for another time. I don't know. But like we have all of these different little things that are differences that, that cause a separation. And then there's some serious ones that are controversial, like you have gay or straight. You got pro-life or pro-choice. You have those that drink alcohol and those that don't drink alcohol in the church. And you have like those that are gonna be vaccinated and, and those that aren't gonna be vaccinated. And are you or aren't you? And if you do, then you're this. And if you don't, then you're this. And you have all of these differences that constantly bombard us with tension. And I'm aware that there are some of the some of the differences that I listed that are simply preferences. There are some of the differences that I listed that are debatable, but there are a few that I listed that are not debatable according to scripture. There are some that there is no gray in any way, shape, or form. But I think that as we think through all these things, it brings up some important, uh, an important point for our church. What is our stance on those that are different than us? Or what type of vibe are we putting off to people that show up at our church that are different than us? So it got me thinking, what if Jesus had a church today? And what would it look like? What would it look like? Because in reality, if Jesus did have a church today, shouldn't our church look like his? That's the intention and that's the goal. So as I read this story about this woman at the well, it was like, I realized that there's some like, there's some things in the scripture that give us insights and some little win some windows of, of revelation and wisdom of what Jesus might build his church like and what his church would be founded upon. And, and so if Jesus had a church today, he would initiate contact with those that are different. He would initiate the contact 
with those that are different. See, this woman in this story, she didn't start the conversation with Jesus. In fact, she was shocked that Jesus actually even spoke to her. And Jesus had this knowing on the inside of him that it was up to him to actually be the one that broke the ice with her. Now later on we realize that it's, and it becomes more evident that as to why maybe he had to be the one to start this conversation because of the fact that she was living in sin. And anytime you're living in sin, you, you, guard, you ever found yourself guarding yourself or you found yourself setting yourself up in such a way that if you have something to hide, I'm gonna actually do relationship or do conversation or have, have live life with this thought of I have to protect this thing. And so Jesus literally, knowing that she lives in sin, initiates a conversation. Now many of us, when we're living in sin, we know we're living in sin. You ever, you ever realize like, I don't need to be told that I'm in sin. I know that I'm in sin. We all live with this thing that's us all of the time. We know the good, the bad, and the ugly. We know when we're in sin, when we're not in sin. The problem is I think that sometimes the reputation of many Christians is that they're loud about other sin and they're very quiet about their own sin. This is one of the differences I think that we live by. So as a church, if we want to be different, if we want to make an impact, if we want people to get back into church, if we want people, the, the ones that are deemed to be unreachable, if we want to reach them, we've got to get to this place where it's, it's not so much about their sin and it's more about who Jesus is for them. It's important that we, as a church, are willing to take the most difficult step in this whole journey, and that's the first step. Can I go across the room, or can I open the door for someone, and can I do it in such a way that I'm actually letting them know we have a commonality and it's Jesus? Before I assess their situation and before I assess their appearance, and say because they don't look, act, think, or are like me, I'm gonna actually let someone else do that. I'm gonna actually let someone else pray for that person. I'm gonna actually let someone else be the hands and feet of Jesus, and I'll only, I'll select the ones that I want. It's like we, we seek out the easy ones. This is not what Jesus intended. We have to reach, we have to initiate, we have to engage, we have to adapt who we are to actually let people in to the kingdom of God. Did you know this, and this, this might be news to some of you? Not all of the ways that we are are scriptural. <laughs> FYI. You're not, like, we're not the way that we are because it's the way that we are. We're the way that we are because sometimes we just want to be that way. Newsflash. And there is actually a standard that is in scripture that should always be, uh, an older gentleman came up to me after the service and he said, man, I just, I appreciate the word because it came from the word. And he said that the word has to always be the compass. It has to always be the thing that I'm constantly bouncing everything that I am and everything that I think and everything that I'm doing off of the word. And if, it, if I can't find it in there and if Jesus didn't demonstrate it to me in there, then I probably should take on a different approach. So we have to reach and we have to initiate. We have to be these people as, body, as a body of believers that can adapt to different people coming. I don't think it's a coincidence that our church was built in this, in this actual location. In fact, on our uh, grand opening, we encountered two different homeless people in a matter of hours that were both high on drugs. One got delivered in the parking lot, like right, right behind this wall, like right before service started. Like Jesus put us here for a reason. And it wasn't so that when different people show up that they get pushed away. It was so that when different people show up, they actually find Jesus, the thing that we found a long time ago that's the reason we're even in this room. I hope that that's why we're in this room, because we love Jesus. That when those kinds of people show up, that hopefully they get invited in in such a way that we clothe them and dress them and help them come into their right mind. Like that's why Jesus had us, that's why the other location that we own north of town didn't work out. Because Jesus knew that this church had to be right here. 
and he's hoping that we'll come alongside him and be a church that looks like the church that he would, would have built. In Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This scripture blows my mind. Yeah. Like it literally just, I don't, I, the, I don't sometimes fathom the depth of the love of God for us. The, in the middle of my, in the middle of our junk, in the middle of our chaos, in the middle of the thing that caused separation, Jesus actually goes to the cross for us. The essence of the gospel is not that Jesus responded to our plea for relationship with him. It's that he initiated relationship when we didn't know that we even needed it. That's who Jesus is. So as the church, we look like Jesus when we initiate with people that are different than us. If Jesus had a church today, people would not simply be accepted in their differences, they'd actually be welcomed in their differences. There's a difference. You remember the movie Dumb and Dumber? One of the greatest movies of all time. Like, it's, it's not even a question. Like, there's not even a debate. It's one of the most quotable movies. Emily, I'm not talking to you. It's one of the most quotable movies ever, and a quotable movie is a good movie, right? But do you remember that moment when they showed up to that Snow Owl fundraiser in this movie? And, and what they were wearing? It's like, if it wasn't evident by the color of their suits that they, um, they weren't supposed to be there, then it was surely made evident that they weren't supposed to be there by the fact that they're actually having a sword fight with their canes as they enter the room. And then they slapping each other with their canes. Like, it's one of the best movies ever, and, and that's the end of the discussion, but even though it was clear that they were let into the doors of this banquet, they definitely probably weren't gonna be invited back. And I often wonder if that's how people feel when they come into a church. Like, I was let in the door of this church, but I'm not sure if anybody that let me in actually cares if I come back. And that's a scary thought. That's a saddening thought. It's like, the only way that I know that they would be interested or care if I come back is if, and maybe they've even heard things like, yeah, if you change the way that you dress, or if you actually made some sacrifices like the rest of us to be here, or if you served like we have for the last 15 years, you might be welcome back, or if you cover your tattoos, or if you break that a bad habit, or if you stop sinning. It's like there's all these preconceived, these like preconditioned terms that are unspoken sometimes, unspoken sometimes, that, that let someone know that they're actually welcome in the church. My point is this, what if people actually felt welcomed in our church? I'm not saying that they don't. I'm just saying what if they felt more welcomed in our church? What if people thought, and if, what if people knew that we thought about them after the day was over? Like what if when you meet someone in the foyer and you introduce yourself, what if that person knew that they knew that you were actually thinking about them when you were at lunch? Like that would settle some things for some people. What if people thought that you would miss them if they didn't come back? Like, I bet, you there's a, I bet you there's a pretty good amount of people in this room that hadn't had someone tell you, I really appreciate you today. I bet you there's a lot of people. I bet you there's a lot of people in this room that haven't heard someone say, hey, I just love you or I'm so glad you're here. Do you know that we go long periods of time without hearing just the simple affirmations that actually change our day when we hear them? What if people thought we had missed them if they never came back to this church? I propose to you this, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit would move on someone's life or move on someone's mind or their heart to visit a church where he knew that they wouldn't be welcomed back. 
Like, why would he set them up for that type of disappointment? Like, why would the Holy Spirit move on someone if he thought, you know what, I've got someone that has, I've got one shot with this person. That if something doesn't shift in their life, I may not get another chance. Why would he send them to a church if they weren't going to be accepted or if they weren't going to be welcomed? Once again, I don't, I'm not telling you and I'm not charging our church with the fact that maybe we're doing a terrible job. I'm telling you that there's another level. I'm telling you that as a pastor, I want to pastor a church, I want to be a part of a church that loves so well that when people come through our doors, they get prophetic words before anyone ever comes up on this stage. They get words that secure their identity in him. They get words that they get an affection from people that secure that they're in the right place at the right time, that they didn't make a mistake, that they aren't a mistake, long before anyone has to ever tell them up here. Like, I want to be one of you that literally is pouring Jesus into every single person that comes through the door the moment that they come through the door. This is the infection. This is the, uh, this is the, the infection of Jesus that I pray actually becomes widespread at Renew Life Church. I pray that Renew Life Church is a church that is guilty of giving away Jesus every single Sunday. If they're gonna ridicule and they're gonna slander us, I pray that the only thing that they could have against us is that we gave Jesus away very, very well. And if they have a problem with us giving away Jesus, they have a lot of problems. I just want us to be that kind of church. Can you imagine how the Holy Spirit would work on someone if he knew that he was setting someone up to walk into a church, that that every single person in the room was anticipating and waiting at the opportunity to give away Jesus. Not only would our church be completely different, but our city would be completely different. It's like we'd have to open doors and just let people listen from the parking lot. This is the kind of thing that happened in scripture. I would like to be that church. We should be that church. I wanna tell you a little bit, I'm just gonna close with this, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about like what my church journey has looked like as, as a person. And, and a lot of you know my church journey and kinda of know my story, but I, I, church wasn't a thing that I was raised in. I told a, a story in the first service. Uh, one of the first times I ever went to church, uh, I was about six and it's like a, a bus came through our parking lot um, of our apartment complex, and uh, I was like, man, I'm gonna jump on this church van, I'm gonna go to church, because I've never gone to church, all my friends are going to church, so I'm in, like, I'm going. So I go, and we do this whole Sunday school thing, and all that thing happens, and then we go into the main sanctuary, this is my first memory of church, and uh, a guy stands on a stage, and it's like a school cafeteria, and uh, he's like, listen, if you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom now, because you cannot get up once the service starts. Well, see, what had happened was at six years old, like I didn't need to go right then. <laughs> but how many know how six-year-olds work? Yeah. <laughs> go on a road trip with them, you'll figure it out really fast. It's like we're not even to Garden City and you already gotta stop. Like, so ch- service starts, I'm nervous as heck. I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm like, but the only thing I can remember is don't get up during the service. And I'm like, if he said it like that, what's gonna happen if I do? Like, I can't afford to die today, I'm six. So, so I just went to the bathroom by myself in the middle of church. And that was like my first church experience. I'm like, I'm not going back to church for a while. Like, it's gonna take a while to recover from this one. But I got saved in April of, of 2005, April 23rd of 2005. Like, I got invited to uh, just a, a super radical miracle healing crusade in Oklahoma City. Uh, a guy named Benny Hinn was putting this thing on, and, and if you know anything about him, there's all the things. And um, I personally love the guy. I never met him, but I would love to. Um, but anyways, uh, I get invited. I actually get challenged. Uh, a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, he, he uh, grew up in church, went to a small, Catholic, uh, small Christian school, like, seen it, done it, done all the things, and he, he challenges me with this, he brings one of this guy's DVDs to my house, and he's like, if, he's like, you gotta see this, like, it's miracles, and people getting out wheelchairs, and I'm like, that's all lies, I don't believe any of that, and he's like, seriously, you don't believe any of this, I'm like, I don't believe a single, I don't even believe a single thing that you showed me, they're all actors, this is not real, 
That was, that was literally my position on God and anything supernatural. And uh, he goes, okay, here's the deal. If you'll go with me to one of this, this guy's crusades and you don't feel something change, I'll never bug you with this whole deal again. And I'm like, well, I can win that bet every day. Like, I can make myself not feel something. It's real simple. So we go to Oklahoma City, go to this event, and uh, literally during worship, I mean, during worship, and it's not good worship. Like, it's not what we have, just yeah. FYI. It's just, it just wasn't. Um, which lets me know if God could do a lot with our worship. Uh, but during worship, I just, I don't know how to explain that to you. I really can't put it into words. I just got so overwhelmed and so undone by the power of God in this room that I just couldn't do anything but weep. The thing that I was actually trying to resist was overwhelming and consuming me. And in this, in this moment of worship, I gave my life to Jesus because there was no other option. It would have been a flat lie. In fact, my, my body even was telling me, you can't deny what's happening. I was even smelling something completely different in the room that I had never smelled before, that I've smelled five other times, period, and, I, and it's the presence of God. Like, I got completely, radically changed in a moment because someone actually initiated a conversation. Someone actually said, if you'll go with me, knowing the life that I lived and knowing my position, even after stating my position, they were still willing to initiate, just like Jesus initiated with his woman. Fast forward to, that was April of 2005, fast forward to September of 2005, still didn't have a church. Same guy that initiated this is like, hey, a friend of mine's coming and he's launching a church in Midland. Uh, I think you ought to go with me to this service. It was right here, it used to be the Hilton, it was in a ballroom. And, uh, a church called Believer's Way launched in Midland on September 11th, 2005, and I went to the first service. And my heart was, if I find Jesus, the same Jesus that I found in worship at that event, this will be my home. First service, I found Jesus. I, I, I fell in love with Jesus again. Like instantly my heart knew the person that I'd met a few months prior was in this room. And these people that I met in this church, they were interested in where I was going. They weren't interested in where I had been all of the years prior. I was 21 at the time. They were interested in where I was about to go. And their thought was, what can we do to help empower you to get to where you're supposed to be? And my journey was crazy. In September of 05, I found a church, or April of 05, I got saved. September, I found a church. In November of 2007, I was in full-time ministry as a children's and youth pastor. I get happened in a couple of years for me. And I believe that it was in part of a church that came around me and said, how do we point you to Jesus so that you could actually be everything that he said you could be? And so when I think about my journey in church, like I'm less sensitive about things that make up differences. And I'm more passionate about the Savior that we all have in common. Because at the end of the day, if, if it's not about Jesus, it's about nothing. There's really no other thing out there. That's how strongly I believe in Jesus. If it isn't Jesus, we're wasting our time. And so I'm just asking you just to go on a journey with me. Like I know we're killing it, I believe we're doing a really, really great job. I'm proud of this church. I'm proud of the fact that I get to come to this church, the people that I get to go to church with. Like, I know that there are, there are stories and there are journeys in this room. There are testimonies similar to mine of what Jesus has done for you. I'm asking you to go as far in as you can go and give as much of Jesus away as you possibly can. A hundred years from now, the only thing that's gonna matter is someone's relationship with Jesus. That's it. It, all of the things that we're arguing about will mean zero in 100 years. It won't matter if you got a vaccination or if you voted red or blue. It won't matter if you had money or if you didn't. But if you knew Jesus, it's gonna matter. Because there is a day coming 
when we're all gonna have to stand in front of God. And we'll have to figure out how we're gonna answer for the life that we lived on the earth. 100 years from now, the only thing that's gonna matter is Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. If you need prayer or have never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, we would love for you to reach out to us. Check out our website at renewlifechurch.com for all of our contact info. Also, if you're interested in financially supporting what God is doing at Renew Life, you can give via our website with text to give or by mailing a check to our office. God bless you and we hope to see you soon.